Your Excellency, professors, dear colleagues, and friends. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome you all here in the Leibniz Hall to the event entitled The Long Li Lines of Nationalism, Authoritarianism, and Democracy. And this is an event hosted by the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities in collaboration with the Hobart Prize, the Norwegian Hobart Prize. <laughs> My name is Kerstin Frutum, and I am the chair of the Hobart Board and professor of linguistics at the Department of Foreign Languages at the University of Bergen. On behalf of the Hobart Board, I would like to thank Professor Christoph Markschis at the Humboldt University in Berlin, and also president of both the Berlin Brandenburg Academy and also the Union of the German Academies of Sciences and Humanities. Thank you so much for a very fruitful collaboration. And this collaboration is highly valuable to us in that it facilitates and strengthens the aim of the Holberg Prize to develop and expand rewarding relations with acad academies around the world. So thank you, Professor Mokshi. Now, given the long and historical excellent relations between German and Norwegian academic institutions, it is particularly present, present to be in Germany. I'm also pleased to mention that two of the Holberg Prize laureates are German. First, Jürgen Habermas in 2005, and then Jürgen Kocka in 2011. And we are particularly delighted that Professor Jürgen Kocka will participate in this seminar today. The Holberg Prize is one of the most prestigious international prizes awarded to outstanding scholars in the humanities, social sciences, law and theology. And the prize was established by the Norwegian government in 2003 in homage to the scientist and writer Ludwig Holberg, who lived from 1684 to 1754. I found out a few years later than Gottfried Leibniz. Holberg was very much inspired by Enlightenment ideas and in fact excelled in the fields covered by the award. So, the Hobel Prize is administered by the University of Bergen on behalf of the Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research. And this year, 2023, marks the 20th anniversary of the Holberg Prize. So we are therefore very pleased to celebrate the anniversary anniversary through today's seminar here in Berlin. Every year, two prizes are awarded in the academic fields of the humanities, social sciences, law and theology. That is the main Holberg Prize and the Niels Klim Prize. And the prizes are awarded by the board on behalf of the University of Bergen and on the recommendation of academ academic committees which consists of outstanding scholars in the relevant academic fields. Now, one of the main ambitions of the Holberg Prize is to inspire young scholars and to promote dialogue across different generations of researchers. The Niels Klim Prize is therefore awarded annually to a young researcher under 35 years of age from or in a Nordic country. And this prize is named after Ludwig Holberg's young hero in his novel Nils Klim's Underground Travels from 1741. And the value of the main Holberg Prize is approximately 600,000 euros, and the value of the Nils Klim Prize, 50,000 euros. So, the laureates of the Holberg and Nils Klim Prizes for 2023 will be publicly announced on the 14th of March this year. However, for the Holberg and Niels Klim prizes of next year, we strongly encourage nominations to be submitted through the website of the Holberg Prize until the deadline 15 June 2023. Finally, I would also like to mention briefly two more initiatives established by the Holberg Prize. First, the Holberg Prize School Project 
which is an annual research competition for students in the upper secondary schools in Norway, and where the three top contributions are awarded prizes. Second, we host and organize the Holberg debate, an annual event inspired by Ludwig Holberg's enlightenment ideas, aiming to explore pressing issues of our time. And now let me get back to today's event, bringing in important questions about the relationship between nationalism, authoritarianism and democracy. It asks, what is the contemporary relevance of these relations? And what can German history tell us about the challenges we face today? We greatly look forward to listening to the three panelists who have kindly accepted to contribute. Professor Jürgen Kocka, Professor Hedwig Richter, and Professor Michael Zürn. And I would like to extend special thanks to Professor Christoph Barkschis, who will introduce the speakers and moderate the debate. So please, Professor Markschis, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, very much, dear Kiestri Flatum, for the kind introduction and for the whole event. And on behalf of the whole Academy, some members of the Academy are already present, and also very personally, the warmest congratulations to the anniversary of the Holberg Prize. The list of prize winners reads like a travel guide to the most interesting researches and topics in the field of humanities and social sciences, ex post, because some were already on everyone's lips when they were awarded, but all are today. And that is a special mark of quality, as are the highly interesting symposia and debates you have mentioned around the award winners and their thematic focuses. I consider myself particularly fortunate that we have Jürgen, Jürgen Kocker with us, one of these laureates already mentioned, among our academy members and that we have thus been able to enjoy an anniversary event in the series of the anniversary events of the Holbeck Prize. Normally, those who celebrate an anniversary receive a gift. Here, the jubilarian presents us a gift. Us a gift with a celebration to those who should actually have presented you with a gift. Our gift, th there is some gift for us for the Holberg Prize, is that we have supplemented the laureate you have chosen, the laureate with our Academy member Michael Zürn and Hedwig Richter. And hopefully together, we three, Hedwig, Jürgen and Michael, and hopefully together we will give them and especially you, a stimulating discussion on the long lines of nationalism, authoritarianism and democracy in Europe and Germany. And now it's time not only to welcome all those here present in the room, but also those present at the live stream, probably a lot of people from Scandinavia, Norway and other countries, a very warm welcome to all of you from Berlin, from, from the center of Berlin, the, the academic center, <laughs> geographic center that we can discuss. No doubt the title 
along the long lines of nationalism, authoritarianism, and democracy in Europe and Germany, a whole bundle of topics that are currently being held debated, not only within the historical and political sciences, but also in the feuilleton pages of the daily newspapers and in the social media. In this respect, it's perhaps not surprising if I first introduce you, Hedwig Richter, to you, ladies and gentlemen, and so following the rule, ladies first, because about the book Democracy, a German Affair, because on this book, a very table, I would think, squabble has broken out among historians. Um, Hedwig Richter has been professor of modern and contemporary history at the Universität der Bundeswehr in Munich since 2019, studied history, German studies and philosophy at the universities of Heidelberg, Queen's University Belfast and Free University of Berlin. In 2008, she re received her doctorate from the University of Cologne, pietism and socialism, and now it's a question of precise pronunciation. The Herrenhuter Brüder Gemeine, not Gemeinde. The Herrenhuter Brüder Gemeine in the GDR and the German Democratic Republic, um, honored with the Offermann Herrgarten Prize of the University of Cologne. She habilitated in 2016 at the University of Greifswald, Modern Elections, a History of Democracy in Prussia and the United States in the 19th century, also awarded by the prize of the Demokratie Stiftung in 2018. And because there are so many prize uh, laureates and their laureation. I'm citing now for every one of the panelists one sentence from a, a laureation from a laureate. And the citation for Hedwig Richter is from the Anna Krüger Preis of the Wissenschaftskolleg, translated into the English language, an outstanding work in a good and comprehensible academic language. It's the focus of the Anna Krüger Preis. And the uh, Anna Krüger Preis jury praised uh, Hedwig Richter's style as of masterful elegance, crystal clear and descriptive. And the citation went on to say, she masters various styles from academic to popular, but never writes dryly, lightly and seemingly effortlessly. She conveys historical political themes and does not shy away from catchy yet precise exaggeration. So, the second person I would like to introduce briefly after following the rule of ladies first is the laureate of the Holberg Prize to 11. And here I quote again from a laudation, this time the Holberg Prize laudation, which is probably known to some of you uh, or some in the room or at the screen. Kocka is an outstanding historian who, by opening up to related fields of social science, has contributed decisively to a paradigm shift in the field of history. Social sciences has contributed decisively to, a, I have cited, to a paradigm shift in German historiography. He is a public intellectual who, through his commitment to the shaping of historical memory and the political role of history um, against exclusion, privilege and inequality, and to the contributing to the support of the enlightened democratic institutions. Of the contemporary historians, Jürgen Kocka is one of the most influential, especially in this academy, as I would like to mention. Some, how I 
should, should address some more details on his life at the moment. Senior Fellow at the Leibniz Center for Contemporary History in Potsdam, permanent fellow of the International College in the Humanities, work and life course in global history, historical perspective at Humboldt University, studied historical sciences, political sciences, German studies, sociology and philosophy in Marburg, Vienna, Berlin, and at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, and the MA and the doctorate at the Free University. Habilitated in modern history in Münster and then professor of ja, Allgemeine Geschichte, general history, I would probably translate this, with a, a special focus in social history in Bielefeld until 1988, uh, director of the famous Center for Interdisciplinary Research, and then from 1988 bis 2009, professor for the history of the industrial world at Free University of Berlin. And also to show one publication, it's quite interesting, and when I got first the Kampf um die Moderne of 2021, then I thought it's quite interesting how he commented on the things he Hedwig Richter mentioned and uh, I will talk about and perhaps we will talk about during the following podium. So I have presented two people to you but I should mention also a third one and this is Michael Zürn and which laudation I can mention here is the laudation for the Berlin Science Prize for the year uh, 2021 where, uh, with which he was awarded uh, two years ago. And there is written, Professor Michael Zürn is one of the most, if not the most, distinguished German political scientists and especially of the academy, the most distinguished. It is impossible to imagine Berlin's research landscape without him and by finding, supporting and further developing various institutions, he has made himself a very important promoter and supporter of Berlin as location for science and teaching. This could also be said probably about Jürgen Kocher in certain different fields. With his latest, uh, with his latest book, and I apologize, I have forgotten it at home. It's a wonderful blue uh, Surkamp Buch, and in so far you can imagine a light blue envelope, and there is written um, democratic regression uh, in, in German. With his latest book, Michael Zürn contributes to one of the most important political debates of our time, the future of democracies. Together with Achim Schäfer, this is a quotation from the laudation. He examines the democratic regression that is also taking place in the heart of the European Union. The focus is on a problem of democracy that has received too little intention. The shrinking space for democratic decision making at the level of the nation state. And this we will have to discuss. Also some hard facts of Michael Zürn, director of the Department of Global Governance at the Berlin Social Science Center, Wissenschaftszentrum zu Berlin, also deeply related to Jürgen Kocker. There are hidden lines, hidden and obvious lines between all the three. Uh, and professor of international relations of the Free University of Berlin since 2004, and the co-speaker of the GFG cluster of excellence, contestations of the liberal script. And as far as I know, there was a discussion last week or the week before of this cluster were some of the end so far. So th there are always lines between the people um, at the podium. Graduated from the University of Denver in 1984. In 1987, he passed his first state exam in political science and German studies at the University of Tübingen and received his doctorate there in 1991 on the topic Game Theory, Functionalism and International Politics. So these 
the three panelists and they will speak later in a little bit different order. Koka will start, Hedwig Richter will follow and Michael Zorn will conclude. But please allow me as a historian and theologian who deals primarily with antiquity, so far away from problems of European democracy of our times. So allow me to make two final remarks on the topic of our discussion, which will follow shortly, and as I have said, will be opened by brief statements from the panelists. The long lines of nationalism authoritarianism and democracy. The discussion of Hedwig Richter's Buch. The discussion of Hedwig Richter's Buch has very clearly presented us once again with a question of whether democracy and authoritarianism are really accurately described when they are radically modeled as opposition and dual. That's, I think, an interesting question. And um, I was uh, reading um, the biography of father and son Planck, uh, the physicist um, Max Planck and his son Erwin Planck. Erwin Planck, Max Planck's son, prepared the so-called Prussian strike Preußenschlag in the Reichschancellery for Chancellor von Papen. The illegal dismissal of the Prussian state government in 1932. All the details of organization. It was not until 1934, after the assassination of the former Reichschancellor Kurt von Schleicher in the course of the so-called Röhmputsch, that Erwin Planck suddenly realized that the dismantling of the constitutional state, also die Zerstörung des Rechtsstaates, was irreversible and began his path into the German resistance because he realized that this was a kind of political system destroying the constitutional state, the Rechtsstaat, which ended the path of Erwin Planck with his conviction by the People's Court, chaired by Roland Freisler, and his execution in 1945. How we deal with the fact that many of the Germans involved in the resistance were committed to the rule of law, devoted to Rechtsstaat, constitutional state, and followed through authoritarian state models. Rechtsstaat und autoritative und autoritäre Staatsmodelle. Is this the devotion to the Rechtsstaat, constitutional state, to the law, a step on a way to democracy? Or precisely not? Is there a specific German history of a connection between this rule of law, constitutional state, Rechtsstaat thinking and democratization. That is something other than a Sonderweg, a special path. Jürgen Kocker interestingly differentiated between Sonderweg und einem besonderen Bereichsweg. So this is probably something we should discuss. And a second completely different observation. As a young girl in Swabia, my wife was still physically beaten, beaten by their teachers in their school. As a young man in Berlin, of course, I have not beaten at no time in school. Today, of course, beating school children is also forbidden in Swabia. Doesn't a history of the body, as Hedwig Richter demands, have to complement the answers to our questions in the history of structures, politics and ideas, but also on the history of the body? So this is an interesting question, I think. 
and I look forward to our discussion. But before we discuss, we will follow the introductions of our panelists. This will start with the Jürgen Kocker, then followed by Hedwig Richter, and concluded by Michael Zu. Then we will discuss a certain while these introductions and other interesting questions. Then perhaps if we are a little bit before midnight, uh, the <laughs> audience, I apologize, definitely not the audience uh, at the screens, but the audience present here in the room will have the opportunity to intervene and then we will continue at the buffet questions and answers. So again, a very warm welcome. Thanks for the gift. We try to send something back in the following minutes and our, hours, no, our, and uh, a very warm welcome. And now Jürgen Kocka will continue. Please. Well, thank you very much for this invitation. And thank you to all the introduction. It's a great pleasure for me and honor to be part of the panel uh, at this occasion, 20th birthday of uh, the Holberg uh, Foundation, Holberg Prize. Uh, and uh, as you know, I had the a great honor to be one of the laureates of this uh, uh, institution uh, more than 10 years ago. Um, thank you for the introduction, Christoph Markschies. You already mentioned uh, the concept um, Sonderweg, special way. And what we thought uh, when we, the three of us, the four of us, talking about how we might construct the uh, discussion tonight. Um, <clears throat> we thought that we should bring together a debate which we have had in history for a long while. The, uh, the meaning, the merits and the limitations of this idea of a German Sonderweg, a German special way on the one hand, with broader issues of uh, debated in the present time as to nationalism, democracy, and authoritarianism. So what I want to do in my first uh, 10 minutes here or so, um, I want to introduce you into the discussion about the Sonderweg, about the special way with certain uh, 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 discretions into the present uh, debate. And then if uh, Hedwig continues, we had some differences in uh, looking on this topic. And then Michael Zern will be at certainly uh, the person who will relate to the general debate on democracy and uh, nationalism today. So the intellectual roots of the Sonderweg view on German history reach back, far back to Max Weber and uh, Thomas Mann, but also, by the way, to uh, Thorstein Veblen, uh, the US-American sociologist around 1900, who was the son of a Norwegian uh, mig migrant, immigrant to the United States. Um, then so-called emigre scholars uh, who had to leave uh, German, Nazi Germany, or had, who had been uh, uh, th thrown out of Germany, Hans Rosenberg, Ernst Frenkel, later on Fritz Stern, have strongly contributed uh, to this view. Although usually without using the word Sonderweg. The view never became dominant among historians, but it became strong and influential in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s particularly, whenever um, people talked about the origins of these catastrophic developments uh, under Nazism in Germany and Europe in the first half of the 20th century. 
In recent decades, the Sonderweg uh, view has become less important. The word is hardly used anymore except by critics. But parts of the substance still uh, play a role. What's the content? What's the meaning of this view on German history? On the basis of comparison, implicit or explicit comparison with Western countries, the Sonderweg argument tried to provide answers uh, to the question why Germany, in contrast to other countries during the crisis of the interwar period, uh, transformed into a radical fascist dictatorship. It was in, this, in the context of this intellectually and politically uh, interesting concern that the critical Sonderweg uh, argumentation emerged. Uh, historians uh, who followed this line of thought identified long-term structures and processes that were seen as uh, having contributed to the collapse of the Weimar Republic and uh, the triumph of National Socialism in addition, of course, to other factors, uh, <clears throat> combination with other more short-term factors such as Germany's defeat in World War I and the inflation and depression and, of course, the personality of Hitler. More specifically, finger was pointed at the weaknesses of the German Bürgertum, uh, on the tenacious uh, strength of surviving feudal uh, elites and traditions, on the enduring uh, impact uh, of an old and powerful bureaucracy never challenged uh, by a successful revolution, on the strength uh, of illiberal elements in the German culture, and everyday life, to the relatively late formation of the German nation state and the way it was formed with violence, as well to the, and also to the blocked and late uh, delayed transition to a parliamentary system uh, of government, which in Germany did not come before 1918. Such factors and others were interpreted as particularities uh, of German history that made the development of liberal democracy in Germany especially difficult, something that ultimately facilitated the rise uh, of national socialism. To a large extent, uh, scholars uh, identified these factors by looking back to the 19th century, particularly to the Kaiserreich, to imperial uh, Germany until World War I. This approach uh, also could be used and was used uh, to interpret German, especially West German history after 1945 as well. It led to the thesis that the Nazi dictatorship and its consequences not only brought the Sonderweg uh, to its lowest point, to its low point, but also contributed to creating preconditions for its demise, for its end. Um, <clears throat> so, in spite of the burdens uh, of the legacy of the pre-1945 period, the Federal Republic of Germany managed to become country that did not define itself anymore in contrast to the West uh, uh, and did not return to anything like a German Sonderweg, um, even not in 1990 uh, when it regained sovereignty. One can see that the self-critical Sonderweg uh, thesis had and still has political implications uh, related to the self-understanding, in a way, to the identity uh, of the German Republic. Um, <clears throat> so, in other words, uh, the self-critical Sonderweg thesis approach was frequently connected to a strong commitment 
to and hope for the development of a liberal democratic Germany after Hitler and after the Holocaust. The hypothesis um, produced by the, so ever since the 1980s at least, there has been much criticism of this uh, approach. I just mentioned some of them. The hypothesis produced by the Sonderweg view led to much empirical research which did not always confirm the hypothesis of the thesis, but uh, led to the modifications and uh, to uh, uh, revisions uh, of the, some elements of the thesis. For instance, it turned out that the German Bürgertum, after all, had not been that weak, particularly if compared with countries east of Germany. Many studies also emphasized with good elements, elements of modernity of imperial Germany. For instance, in the field of science and the arts, but also with respect to elements of uh, democratization and gender emancipation, as uh, Hedwig Richter uh, has uh, emphasized. Theoretically, the notion, theoretically, criticism of the Sonderweg thesis uh, took place with good reason. It is a more, it is a criticism we also know from the debate about any kind of exceptionalism. It is more uh, adequate to see the German development as one of the many different ways or variants taken by European history in the 19th century, one of different ways. So, guiding, also guiding interests of scholars have shifted. New questions and answers take center stage. This is legitimate, normal, and necessary. After more than 70 years, uh, history of the Federal Republic of Germany as a relatively successful liberal democratic community, the way has changed and is changing in which we look on the 19th century. As a consequence, imperial Germany is not only and perhaps even not mainly seen as a predecessor of the Weimar Republic and Nazi Germany, but also as a predecessor of the Federal Republic after the end of the Sonderweg. Particularly younger historians have contributed to this changing view and new ways of dealing with problems of history uh, have entered. Finally, it is obvious that the history of Western countries or even the history of the West has been the main reference um, with which uh, German history was compared whenever it was interpreted as a Sonderweg. Gradually, but gradually, the West has become a more problematic yardstick by which to assess German history. That was true even before Donald Trump got into power. And this uh, process continues under the impact of globalization and particularly under the powerful impact of present post-colonial discourses. The rise of global history and the emphasis on colonialism as a central ingredient of Western history in modern times are changing the mood, the perspectives, the assumptions which impact on the way we look on, we look on the past. All this has helped to modify and relativize the Sonderweg view on modern German history. Much of this kind of revision makes sense and represents improvement in, uh, of our knowledge. But I think this revision should not go too far. In my opinion, certain elements of the Sonderweg approach continue uh, to be valid. First, it would be a problematic truncation or even distortion if interpretations of the history of imperial Germany 
would not be sensitive to the fact that only 15 years later, a radical fascist dictatorship had come to power, which was about to move Germany, Europe, and other parts of the world uh, into a major catastrophe. Second, the victory of fascism in Germany was not only due to short-term reasons, uh, like the defeat and the humiliation of 1918-19 and other factors, but it was also made possible and facilitated by long-term processes reaching back into the 19th century at least. So the Sondervik discourse has correctly identified some of them, like strong traditions of illiberalism um, in German culture, like the very late parliamentarization of its constitution, and uh, the detrimental effects of the large role of anti-liberal and, and authoritarian parts of the elites. And thirdly, and I would like to particularly address this to Hedwig, there is no direct uh, or linear way from the elements of democratization in Imperial Germany uh, to the democracy of the Federal Republic today. In between stands Hitler and Hitler's empire and its defeat by forces from outside Germany. Defeating it thoroughly with military force has been a precondition of the relatively successful history of democracy in post-war Germany. And when I look for early sources of democracy in German history, I still prefer uh, to look on the formats and 1848 and the Weimar Republic more than on the elections and the social movements of Imperial Germany. Here I stop. I think one of the more general aspects for our discussion, within the Imperial Germany, with the Imperial Empire, it has become much clearer in recent debates than we thought some years ago, that you have together, combined, on the one hand, traditions of authoritarianism and uh, uh, illiberalism, uh, on the one hand, and elements of modernization, of emancipation uh, progress uh, on the other. And it is an interesting and in a way disturbing uh, result to see that this is possible and also possible in present day uh, systems. And uh, secondly, I hope that we can discuss later and what we such a, such a debate on German Sonderweg might imply with reference to more general uh, topics we will certainly come to later. So thank you very much. Um, first, let me thank you for this invitation. Um, it's a great honor and I'm very happy that I can join this panel tonight. And then let me confess that I agree with most of what Jürgen said. Thank you so much for what you said. I will start with an idea that the far-right movements cannot be dismissed as anti-democratic. Philip Mano has rightly pointed this out and of course many others did. The proponents of these movements claim to be the true Democrats. Not only in Germany, we see this everywhere, at the moment most prominently in the United States. Democracy is not per se liberal democracy. In this respect, I think it is worth taking a look at German history. Two points seem particularly important to me. First, populism or fascism depend on broad sections of the population. What they want is unrestricted, untamed rule for the leading party or the leader. Far-right movements brand liberal elements as undemocratic and aim at their destruction. 
separation of powers, checks and balances, protection of minorities, or very important also, the rule of law. National socialism and the numerous fascisms emerged from democracies, not from authoritarian monarchies. Although there are undoubtedly lines of continu continuity, Jürgen, I, I absolutely agree. Why are the masses so essential to far-right and fascist movements? Of course, there are huge differences, but tonight we, as far as I understand, we kind of put this together. So why are the masses so essential? This leads me to the second point, which takes a, a bit more longer. We have to look on the emergence of mass societies in the last third of the 19th century. In Germany, of course, this was the period of the Kaiserreich. Democratizing inclusion of societies and racist, militarist, anti-Semitic exclusion then went hand in hand. This inclusion and exclusion can be seen internationally. In all industrialized countries, with great differences, of course, but the parallels must be noted. So let's start with the inclusion around 1870, and this is the kind of the starting point of mass politicization, the last third of the 19th century. Around 1870, within a few years, the legal basis was established in many industrialized countries, and they did so within a few years. Great Britain doubled the number of eligible voters in 1867 with the Second Reform Act. France established the Third Republic. In Sweden, Belgium, the Netherlands, Austria, Hung Hungary, and many other countries, reforms enlarged the electorate or strengthened parliamentary parliamentarism. The Germans introduced universal and equal male suffrage in 1867, shortly thereafter also the United States. The mass press, urbanization, the publicity of parliamentary work, the omnipresence of the so-called social questions discussed in all classes, rising prosperity, ensured the inclusion of men, in particular, much more so than women. Also important is the decrease in working hours, so that men had time for political engagement and party activity. Mass movements emerged. The most important were, I would say, the labor movement, and the various women's movements, which initiated one of the greatest upheavals, the change of the gender order, the emancipation of half of humanity. Most recently, Katja Hoyer's book on the Kaiserreich drew attention to the strong democratization during this period. Also very crucial for the inclusion of societies is nationalism. Dieter Langewiesche speaks of the nation as a driver for equality in the 19th century. And the sociologist Leah Greenfeld writes about the connection between nationalism and democracy, quotation, democracy was born with the sense of nationality. Nationalism was the form in which democracy appeared in the world, end of quotation. The concept of nation made equality plausible all men are equal before the nation, whether poor or rich, noble or not, all men are citizens. This is one explanation of why nation became so incredibly attractive. But nation, of course, illustrates particularly vividly the extent to which inclusion entailed exclusion. The idea of nation was always dazzling, but by the end of the 19th century, it had become increasingly aggressive especially in Germany, but by no means only there. This can partly explain why the period around 1900 is not only a time of democratization, but also a time when racism, anti-Semitism and militarism flourished. In the United States, lynching experienced its peak during this period. And during the same period, African Americans were again almost completely excluded from the right to vote. It seems important to me that these, that these nations, which saw themselves as homogeneous and were highly inclusive, where the broad population identified with the state as never before through nationalism, 
These states were strong as never before. National identity gave these states the strength for colonialism. Of course, other reasons also contributed um, to colonialism. Nevertheless, colonialism and nationalism and mass politicization belong together in a complex way. Ulrich Herbert speaks, speaks of plebiscitary imperialism, plebiscitary imperialismus. Finally, two very brief comments on tonight's topics. Firstly, the Sonderweg thesis is no longer supported by almost any historian today. I don't think I used the term in my book. Um, so this um, David Blackburn and Jeff Ely have shown in their book The Particularities of German History in 1984 why this narrative makes little sense also theoretically. And as for the democratization of the Kaiserreich, Margaret Anderson, this great American historian, she wrote The Essentials 20 years ago. Also many others wrote on this topic, like Andreas Biefang or Robert Asenschik. I think the Sonderweg thesis has only caused so much excitement recently because it is still very present in public discourse. I have seen time and again how surprised and sometimes kind of horrified journalists have been when the Sonderweg was questioned. The second short um, comment, beyond this strangely belated public discussion, it seems important to me that by making German history less exotic, we get a more differentiated view of the history of democracy. If you write a glorious history of democracy, then the darker sides get lost from view. Nevertheless, what Jürgen Kocka says again and again is true. Most of the things Jürgen Kocka says is, um, said is, is, um, are true, I think. Though the Sonderweg narrative does not make much sense, the question remains why Germany and why 1933? The answer becomes more difficult if we dispense with the teleological narrative of an exotically undemocratic German nation and see how strongly Germany was embedded in the history of the so-called West. And I think the German um, democratic history goes um, long before 18, it starts long before 1871. And of course, the formats was most important or the um, revolution of 1848. Thank you so much. Dear Chairwoman, thank you for the invitation. Dear President, my President, uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I have to admit it's not only an honor to be part of this panel, it's also sort of a, of a wonderful role that I have to, to speak as a social scientist to this historical debate. I mean, I even could say to adjudicate the differences between two famous historians, so that's something I, I really enjoy, I have to say. No, no kidding. Um, uh, I, I will speak as a social scientist and will try to contribute uh, to, to this uh, debate and I mean clearly uh, to start out with this from a social science perspective uh, there is no one way of modernity um, there are only multiple ways to modernity uh, to, to, to cite Samuel Eisenstadt and that means of course uh, formally speaking there can be no Sonderweg uh, as if all the others followed a similar pathway in only Germany, uh, another one. But then again, there's also no question. Uh, Germany, Germany's history is very, very special. And we should not uh, uh, make this speciality too small. I mean, there is one laureate here, but another laureate, uh, Jürgen Habermas, uh, I think, made this point very clearly in a huge debate in the 1980s, that we should see the very, very special uh, uh, development of, of uh, German history. But no question, and here I'm clearly uh, uh, with both of you, the German way to modernity consists of, a, uh, of more or less secular developments that all contribute uh, to uh, something that justify the term modernity, right? I mean, the 
development, the formation of value fears, fears to uh, speak with Max Weber. And in the European context, at least, these uh, developments uh, stand for, I mean, Jürgen Kucker describes it as, Oh, you, you, you took your books with you, uh, Christoph Marx is in this, uh, in this uh, most recent book. Uh, they stand for industrialization, for the rise of an influential bourgeoisie, for the shrinking size of families and the rise of the nation state. This is a commonality of all the European ways into modernity. Um, and it amounts to something like the international context that Hedwig Richter is, is uh, emphasizing uh, very strongly in her uh, Demokratie eine deutsche Affäre. But of course, all those general developments played out very specifically in different local contexts. Uh, and uh, asking for the specificity of the German way to modernity is something that needs to be asked uh, against the background of Holocaust. And that means, of course, uh, there is a need to look on uh, the specific uh, German way uh, because it is impossible to explain this Holocaust the uh, dominance of, of the national uh, socialists for uh, 12 years uh, in this country and uh, the brutality of the aggression of World War II uh, only as a sort of a historical accident. There is a, a high likelihood, to put it this way, uh, that uh, this is not only a historical accident, it is rooted to some extent in a history that made uh, this development possible, uh, that created a sort of an opp opportunity space. Then there were still many specific decisions that have an element of an historical uh, uh, accident, but we are talking uh, about uh, the, the creation of an opportunity uh, space. And um, in order to separate something, I think Jürgen Koka has pointed it to, to, to it already in, in his contribution. Uh, if we talk about historical explanations, we talk about two types, at least two types of, of explanations. One is, and that's my first point to, to point out this difference, one is historically long-standing structures of a society. And most of the German Sonderweg debate focused on differences in these social structures. We all know this type of explanation according to which the state was of a latecomer structured society and carried the potential of authoritarianism. Uh, the keywords are late but extremely fast industrialization, ongoing strong role uh, for traditional authorities and traditional modes of production. And of course, also related to the latecomer uh, status is uh, an ethnic understanding of the nation. But then, especially social scientists point to another type of explanation, and that is something that is very much associated with a reasoning that we call historical institutionalism. Uh, historical institutionalism assumes that all actions, all decisions, take place in institutional or, if you may, structural environments, and uh, therefore are very much directed and, and, and structured uh, by these environments. But at the same time, there are many situations in history that come close to something as critical junctures. Critical junctures are defined as moments when it suddenly opens the space for decision, uh, suddenly opens the space for agency uh, against the long term, long running structures of a society. And of course, the rise of uh, uh, fascism in Germany is also very much determined by certain decisions in those moments of historical crossings. Uh, the decision taken by a, in a historical crossing, in a critical juncture, is not something that allows you to predict the outcome, because the, the history is full of those crossings, and you can always go then uh, different uh, routes, but at least five of those critical junctures were very important for the history uh, of German, let's say, uh, of Germany, let's say, after uh, after 1870. I mean, there's certainly Bismarck's way of nation building. Uh, there is the 
complete catastrophic decision making leading to World War I. Um, uh, there is, of course, if we look on the international level, the Versailles Treaty, um, there is the also on the international level, the response to the 1929 uh, uh, crisis, and of course, there is the decision of the old elite to collaborate with Hitler. I mean, all those moments were moments of agency, of, of, of historical decision-making, to some extent independent of uh, the historical uh, structure, and it's only the combination of those two types of historical explanation that essentially uh, can uh, make it possible, at least from a social science perspective, to, to explain a specific, uh, a specific development, to explain the specific German way after 1933. Uh, um, I want to make one more point, and that is my second point. I mean, the first point is the distinction between these two types of explanation that really need to come together. Uh, um, and that clearly say the whole notion that the German way that Sonderweg determined and uh, a Holocaust is obviously wrong because there were many moments of decisions, but then at the same time, the decisions took place in a certain uh, societal structure and therefore uh, this societal structure, this historical structure played a role. Um, using now, and this is my second point, uh, this distinction and especially the notion of critical junctures uh, is something that leads, or that I want to do this in order to, to explain something which looks maybe somewhat strange. I mean, I, on this point, we know that we disagree, Hedwig. Uh, I consider authoritarian populists as a, as a threat to democracy. I have enormous problems to think uh, about the notion of democracy without the liberal pillars that are undermined uh, by, by those movements. Uh, making arguments in the name of the people is something else than democracy. Democracy is a more complicated concept that includes rights, that includes uh, open public space, that includes the possibility of deliberation, uh, and that includes an open and fair competition, all, and, and it includes also a rule of law. Uh, and all those elements are challenged increasingly by those offering herring populists, especially if they are in power for 10 or 15 years. And if we take now these authoritarian populists as a danger for democracy and as an element of weakening of democracy, then we have suddenly a sort of reverse science uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the cause and in the effect of history, because now the Western states, the early modernizers, France, UK, and the US, are those which seem to be weaker and which have stronger authoritarian populist forces uh, than we see currently in Germany. So uh, the, the effect of the history, if we say all oh, this is also historically caused, is suddenly reversing. Um, and uh, there may be reasons in the first type of historical explanation, that is the social structure explanation, and may possibly could turn around that the latecomer status leads to a situation in which the latecomers like Japan, Germany, and so on, still have a strong industrial base, which essentially uh, uh, softens the effects of globalization, uh, leads to a less strong uh, rural um, uh, um, uh, uh, city divide to, to a, a less rural urban divide. Uh, also, the economic disruptions are in uh, economies that still have a strong industrial base, and, and in principle, one can say that the latecomers have, a, have still a stronger industrial base uh, than the very service uh, industry-oriented uh, uh, early modernizers like UK, uh, US, and to some extent also uh, France. That may play a role, but I think more important are critical changes here in order to understand the relative stability of uh, the German democracies. And I just want to highlight two things which seem to me important. One is the decision about the German constitution after World War II. And there is one decision which is important in this context, and that is the decision to have 
not a majority voting system, but a proportional voting system, a proportional uh, system of voting, leading to a situation that you can have, as in Sweden, for example, as well, um, um, a party, a strong nationalist or authoritarian populist party that gets 15 or 20 percent of the votes, moves into the parliament, but then can be ignored by the other parties, by the majority. So there is a sort of a, of a neglect, of a benign neglect, uh, uh, not anymore in Sweden, but it is the case in Norway and it is also the case uh, in, in Germany, a benign neglect of those parties when they are part of a multi-party system with 50 or 20 uh, percent of the votes in the parliament. This is different in the early modernizer countries where we all have majority voting systems. Um, in France, it's more complicated, as we all know, but if we look to the US and the UK, there the authoritarian populists need to capture the conservative party. And by capturing the conservative party, it's suddenly a situation they against us. It is uh, the, always the possibility that uh, the authoritarian populists gain power. Uh, and in that sense, the proportional voting system, which is the result of a critical juncture, uh, is something uh, that may explain to some extent the reverse science of history. Another one is, of course, and here I can be extremely short, um, the the decision of Germany to be uh, part of the European integration and to uh, essentially uh, downplay the role importance of or to transfer the meaning of national identity uh, which is very much embedded in a European identity. That is another historical decision which is here important. So, in short, the German way is no Sonderweg, but Germany's way is a way that is different from all the others. But not all laps of this German route are more complicated or more difficult or more dark than uh, in other routes to modernity and later on. Thank you very much. I would like now to invite the panelists to the podium. I should sit in a middle position and Perhaps Hedwig here, Michael there, and Jürgen at the leftist position, <laughs> but only in the design of the podium. I think um, after those introductor, uh, introductory statements, for which not only I, but I think the whole auditory and also the people at the screen are especially thankful, we should discuss two topics. The first topic is the question how exactly the differences between Hedwig and Jürgen concerning the history of Germany can be framed with the help of the categories of Michael. And the second part of our discussion should be what was already mentioned, what uh, these discussions and insights can help to analyze and to deal with the, um, yeah, with, with the difficulties of democracies uh, at the moment in Europe. Th these, I would think, are the two parts. And I would ask for short answers because that then we have more interaction than uh, with long answers. And I think the, the first question you two should discuss is Jürgen's quite clear statement. I'm more interested, I think these were your words, I'm more interested in the clear break which came up by the year 1933 uh, and the prehistory, and I'm not so interested in, this was a quite interesting wording, in, in the um, continuities uh, um, between 1949 and the Kaiserreich. Uh, and so, so the question is, Hedwig argued against and already mentioned those questions of um, 
election system introduction and, and other things. And the question is, what exactly Jürgen means, I'm not so interested. Is it neglectable? Should it be neglected? Is it worth of interest? And if you have answered, then he should reply. Well, also from my point of view, I did not see many conflicts uh, between <laughs> the two representations of Hedwig uh, and myself. And I think there would probably be more if we talk about our books, but this is not really something yeah. we should do now. <laughs> but I find it interesting, not a conflict, but a certain uh, uh, difference of approaches. Uh, Hedwig, and again more in the book than uh, today, has uh, decided this that very interesting decision to start with the 18th century for writing the history of German uh, democracy and uh, uh, stressing very much uh, also the history of gender and the history of the body and the control of the body. And uh, from this type of uh, uh, innovative, I would say, approach, uh, you are bound to uh, stress much more long lines of development, change of course, but not breaks. And uh, on the other hand, uh, I, in also in my discussion of the long 19th century, I um, have uh, uh, stressed, I guess, uh, more certain um, interruptions, certain caesuras, like World War I, and then, of course, the rise of uh, uh, National Socialism in 1933. And one of the questions I would have to ask to Hedwig is, would you see a danger in stressing these long continuities besides the virtue and the merits of it? No question. I mean, is there a certain, can there be a certain tendency in your approach which underestimates the perils of uh, our development, the special burdens of German history, which I talked yeah. about. So, so it's not only a question of the perspective and the interest in a certain perspective, but it's also a question of the danger related perhaps to, to a certain perspective. That, that's a wonderful clear-cut question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um I think it's really not so surprising that we agree in many aspects because I learned so much from you, Jürgen. My, 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 my library is full of books from Jürgen Kocker, so um, yeah, I, I, and, and um, it's really a great honor for me to discuss this with you. Um, and of course there is this danger that we take the German history as a normal history. And of course this is a very right right um, winged uh, few to, to say the, um, um, Germany is, is, is just a, a normal country or, or the history is a kind of glorious history, the positive Sonderweg and um, this was only, it, 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 um, and Nazi Germany was only, um, um, a, 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 yeah, it, it happened by chance and, um, and I, writing the history of the 19th century and 20th century, Neuere and Neueste Geschichte, you always have the, on the horizon, you always have 1933, you always have to think about the Holocaust. This is very, very important. And I also wrote in my book that in the heart of the German history I write is the, is the Holocaust. And um, I, I always stress this again and again, and I think it's very important that some told me that I, that I have this right-winged views, which, which really I, I, I never wrote or said something like that. And I always stressed how important it is. But I think that we can have a new look on Western, on, on the West and on 
his, uh, the history of democracy if we don't treat Germany as a total um, exotic nation. And I th um, for me, it was really striking to study the history of elections in my habilitation. During the 19th century, I compared um, uh, Prussia to United States. And of course, I thought it is a, a, a history of, of huge differences. And then I was really surprised to see that in most industrial countries, the development happened within a few years, like the introduction of, of um, a, a broad suffrage or like parliamentarism or like um, um, uh, what we saw around 1870, that it was within a few years that these countries introduced um, broad suffrages. Or like, the, of course, the revolution of 1848 and 1849, um, not only in Germany, uh, it, 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 uh, it, didn't, it didn't work, but also in Germany, like in other countries, um, 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 constitutions after that were introduced, and so forth. And I think um, um, it, it is much more interesting to have an international look on the history of democracy, also to understand the dark sides of democracy. And I think for a long time, um, the, the, the story of the, the bright West and the exotic dark Germany helped to ignore um, colonialism, for example. And, um, and, and we can understand much better why this time around 1900, which, which was so democratized, um, such a huge time for demo democracy, um, for mo women's movements, labor movement, why this was also the time of racism and the time of anti-Semitism and um, yeah, the time of colonialism. I would like to ask Michael, your or not alternative, your, your, your interest in to mark two structures, the long durée and the juncture. How this is related to the historian's um, bifold long durée, continuity and break. It, is this to a certain extent the same or is a certain difference which can, to a certain extent, reframe or recontextualize uh, what the two discussed in the last minutes? Yeah, I mean, first of all, let me just say that I think it's very important what both of you pointed to uh, in, the, in the last exchange, that there is, of course, a sort of a analytical explanatory question and there's also a question of historical responsibility. Uh, and in this specific case of this country, they can be not completely separated. There's some, some, some element of, of going uh, uh, together. And I, I just want to highlight this point, that, that, this, is, that this seems to me uh, very uh, important. In my view as a social scientist, and on the basis of this distinction, I mean, I would probably read uh, Hedwig's uh, work as one that says, well, this is one of those ways into modernity that went at a certain point wrong, but it went wrong very late, essentially, and it is very much driven by those wrong uh, decisions in critical junctures, while uh, the remaining sympathy for the Sonderweg explanation uh, puts more emphasis on the long-term, uh, uh, long-durée uh, uh, structures. Uh, that would be probably the way in order to, to emphasize the difference between the two and to overemphasize it. That would be the way I would describe it. And, and then again, I mean, um, I'm very sympathetic and I thought I... It's, it's obvious that there were many critical decisions uh, that could prevent a national, uh, national socialism even after Germany went its way of modernization. In that sense, uh, uh, I think it is important to see these specific uh, decisions. But from a comparative perspective, it remains, of course, also true that we are not talking about Germany as the only latecomer. I mean, there are other... As the only latecomer, there are other latecomers, and they have 
similar uh, histories. I mean, if we talk about Italy, if we talk about uh, Japan, so the industrial latecomers uh, of the more developed nations uh, went a certain way, and the early modernizers like uh, UK, um, 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 France, uh, and also the US went a certain way, and, and that speaks for a certain irrelevance and importance of the long durée structures. The, the first, then Jürgen, but first a, a question to Hedwig. If we are integrating certain other forms of history, for example, body history, um, then the um, paradigm, the late Germany or whatever, I think is sharpened. The, it, concerning the body history of female scholar, high school scholars in Swabia, which were beaten in, in the late 60s, then, then Germany is extremely late. Uh, 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 state on the way to democracy, like a lo lot of others. So, so the question is, what about these um, elements of pluralization, like multiple modernities, which will allow to, um, how to say, to, to color the, the um, um, image of imperial Germany, but, but also to color, to put in more uh, lighter parts and more darker parts, but also the uh, liberal democracy uh, Germany after 49. So, so the, is the, the, the integration of these paradigms changing the, the, the clear-cut periodization, uh, liberal democracy here and uh, uh, imperial, um, Deutsches Kaiserreich, imperial state before and in between? Yeah, I, I would absolutely say that the long durees are most important also for the explanation of national socialism. I see national socialism and fascism, um, it's, it, it, it comes out of, of, of mass politicization, it comes out of democracies. <clears throat> and of course the, the long developments are very important. And, um, and what you said about uh, corporal punishments, it's so interesting. This is one of, one of, of thousands of features we have of the Sonderweg still going on in, in public space. For example, in France, corporal punishment was much longer executed mm. than in Germany. And um, I, I think today you can't say that France was... was um, um, was, a, was an early modernizer, thinking of Napoleon III. Um, um, I, I think it's really these, these kind of, of um, yeah, of, of, um, of conceptual, um, of um, um, theoretical conceptions. I, I don't think they convince anymore. It, it is, it, we, we have much more um, um, empirical evidence um, um, that, that it is difficult to speak of um, so easily of latecomers and mm -hmm. of early modernizers. So, Jürgen, you're interested to intervene, <laughs> obviously. I have two points to make, yeah. Um, I'm interested to see that uh, Michael, who is now the more the, on the side of the systematic social sciences, uh, stresses the, what was the name, the critical junctures, yeah. the moments in which things may turn differently. Well, historians, at least today, and I'm usually, both of us, uh, have stress, are stressing structures and processes. <laughs> Traditionally, it was the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It's a typical, it's a long debate of historians between <laughs> Persönlichkeit und yeah. Verhältnisse, yeah. <laughs> structures and agency. And uh, so it's uh, ironic in a way that Michael has to remind us historians <laughs> that there are critical junctures <laughs> and moments in which things may turn out. So, I mean, maybe we should think about it. Huh? Yes. My, second, <laughs> my second point is, and I, my second point is a question again to Hedwig. Let's think about the social relevance of and the political relevance of our approaches. The, the political functions of our approaches are not supposed to decide about what we do. And they certainly are not uh, telling us what is true and what is less true. But we have to keep them in mind. We should. We do. Yeah. But particularly those of us who also write in newspapers and uh, in the media. And, you know, 
this, I agree with you that we should have give up the concept Sonderweg. I don't like it, I don't need it. By the way, most of the authors who have contributed to this view, like Mosse, like Stern, like Gordon Craig and, uh, and Wähler and others, did not use the word Sonderweg to describe what they do. It's a matter of the critics, the, those who are critical of our approaches use the word Sonderweg and I can do without the word completely, but not without the substance and here we had some agreement too. So I mean, there's the substance of what we tried to say when we talked about these German particularities was a self-critical purpose. Mm. High point of this discussion, 60s, 70s, 80s. Think about historical streit and, you know, this attempt to come, to find a way to deal with this very dark parts of our past and to get it into a public debate and in our own consciousness. And here I think the Sonderweg thesis, without then calling it this way, has served a very important topic, a very important purpose. It has helped to on this modest, cultural, wissenschaftliche level to make the federal republic the kind of liberal, relatively reasonable state. But what about the other way, if you stress the democracy as a German affair and a, a success story? Is that, a, is that, has this the contrary uh, effect? Is it this kind of building up the self-assuredness of Germans? Uh, should they be less critical with their past in order to be more able to be active? Is that an implication of your approach? Short answer, because we have to move to the second part of our discussion. There were certain rhetorical questions by you, I think, which one can answer shortly. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No. <laughs> doesn't matter. No, no. Is, is your approach politically innocent? That, that's no uh, uh, rhetorical yeah. question. Yeah. Um, uh, of course, um, uh, we always have to have in mind, um, as I said and as I always stressed, the, um, the Holocaust and, and National Socialism. I think you can't write German history even of the 19th century without thinking about that. And um, I do not only speak about the, the um, kind of positive side of the Kaiserreich, but also of the critical modern, the critical modern sides of the Kaiserreich. And I think mass politicization is not only democracy, it's not only democratization, but it's also, um, 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 it has the tendency to, to populism, as we can see around 1900 in the United States with populism or with racism. And so um, to stress these lines um, between um, um, uh, uh, the 19th and 20th century, it's to see um, that democracy is in danger that democracy is not only this, this, this bright history from triumph to triumph and then finally Germany um, came in after 1945. But Germany was part of the West and was, um, um, was part of this uh, very complicated, ambivalent history of, of mass politicization. And I, I think that to, to use the term democracy for 19th century is very often are uh, historical because people in 19th century, even in, at the Kaiserreich time, didn't speak of democracy. It was important mm. for them to have a parliament, to have a, um, a suffrage and to have a... Volkstaat. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, I, 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 I totally agree there is a danger and I always stress that we, um, if we write German history, we have to think about that. Second part of our discussion, I think especially the Holberg Prize Committee interested the question how these, to a second extent, German debates are contributing to the question what is the fate of democracies in Europe now, today? And th there was a, sh I think, controversy between Hedwig and Michael concerning the question, are these far-right movements 
born of or part of democratic movements? Are they part of the democratic spectrum? Are there, to, to, to sharpen it a little, little bit, Michael, are there not only multiple modernities, but also multiple democracies or multiple approaches, such we love to uh, see and others we are not very happy with? Um, or is there one clear-cut definition of democracy, uh, democracy and these far-right um, movements out of? And, and perhaps the best idea is that Hedwig is replying to your critique and then you and then Jürgen Kocker should be involved and then we should try to answer the, the Holberg Prize Committee question, uh, how we can contribute to Poland, Hungary and uh, all these um, difficult developments of democracies in, in Europe. So, Hedwig, yeah. first. Yeah. Um, um, first, of, um, I think far-right um, populist movements are a danger for democracies, but I think stable democracies can deal with it. I think even um, um, France, the French democracy would survive Le Pen. It, it would be terrible, and I, I think the United States somehow survived Trump. Of course, there is no end to it until now, and um, perhaps Trump will come back, or even a, a worse um, um, variation of Trump. But um, uh, I think that democracies can deal with, with it. Of course, I'm not sure. I can't, I can't um, say what will happen. Um, but I think a, a problem of the discourses um, we have in public um, since perhaps since the 50s, is that we, every year or every second year, we proclaim a crisis of democracy. So as old as democracies are, we speak of a crisis of democracy. And I think this, um, of on, on the one hand, these discourses are very helpful for democracies because democracies live off a critique and to, to change it and um, to improve. But on the other hand, um, to have all the time um, discourses of crisis makes us death for um, what we now see as a, as a, I think it's a very new and an absolute um, different kind of challenge, which is the climate change. And if we speak about democracy, we have to, um, today we have to ask how democracies can deal with that. We have no time and um, it will destroy freedoms. And um, so I would, I would, um, um, say, speak less about um, um, crisis of democracies, um, think more about, before you speak of crisis of democracies, and we should think more about this, this great um, um, and terrible challenge of the climate change. Probably Michael will ask you, I'm not quite sure, but whether you have really answered his question, are these far-right movements uh, part of a of, as you have said, th this question concerning is it uh, correct to label them d a part of democracy or to a certain extent a part of a democratic movement, state, society or whatever that he questioned and said. Uh, but but I perhaps... Can, I can yeah. put my question, question. in different words, <laughs> yeah. right? So, I mean... Okay. Uh, <laughs> better you ask your question than I mean, me. I mean, uh, I... I do agree that, let me start out with this, I do agree that climate change is important. Uh, but it, even, even in, eight, in the time of climate change, it is possible that a democracy dies. And we, uh, if we want to battle uh, climate change, I think we need democracies, we cannot do it without democracies. So, uh, I, I would resist playing out this problem with the other problem. Uh, what, I, what I would argue is, uh, yes, democracies can survive uh, authoritarian populists. I mentioned cases in which they are essentially kept out from the possibility to gain power. Um, then there are cases in which they are in power, but get voted out after four years. Uh, this is something that happened in the US, that happened in Brazil. Uh, in those cases, there is 
still hope for the democracies, but they are under pressure, under high pressure. Uh, but then there are cases when those authoritarian populists get re-elected. And if they get re-elected two or three times, the strategy is essentially undermining the pillars of democracy. And it is, consists of three elements. One is essentially undermining uh, judicial independence. Uh, the second step is, yeah. is control of public media. And the third and final step is oppression of opposition. That is something that we begin to see in Poland, that we see already much more developed in Hungary, and I even would argue, in a sense, Putin was the first uh, authoritarian populist taking power. We forget that he was elected in a free election uh, uh, at the end of the 1990s, but he is controlling now the country for 20 years and nothing is left of democracy. So in that sense, authoritarian populists can uh, challenge democracies and essentially can get rid of democracies. What we currently see, for example, and this is really, really horrible, what we currently see in India is exactly this kind uh, uh, of, uh, of, of, of story. And um, I think in the democratic regression, we even don't use the term crisis. We don't have to use the term crisis. The situation is that after 70 years of permanent growth in the number of democracies mm. in the world, in the quality of democracies in the world. After 70 years of growth, we have since 2005 a systematic decline in the, sh in the share of democracies in the world and in the democratic quality, if you give any credit to those uh, democracy parameters. In that sense, I mean, I would not talk about the crisis. I would say we see a development in which the relative importance of democracy goes down and in which it is challenged in some countries by authoritarian populists to the extent that we do not see the democracy anymore. Uh, in that sense, I have problems to say, well, they speak uh, in the name of the people and they pretend to be the better Democrats. That may be true, that this is a rhetorical move, but I still would say they are no Democrats. And there of course no, not. And there's no of model of not. democracy behind it. <laughs> yes, of course not. Um, um, but but, but I, I, this is only a historical question. We, we, we can't just say they are anti-Democrats and then we can write a bright history of democracy and this very dark history of not democracy. I would say, if, as we can see in the Kaiserreich and in the German case, that, um, um, that, that populism, fascism comes out of democracies. So this is the historical argument, but today I would say, of course, a liberal democracy is something totally different to what they claim to be. So, of, of course, I don't say, um, oh, these are all democracies, so never mind. Of course not. Well, I mean, the question is whether we consider those authoritarian populists as a danger for democracy or not. Yes, this there, is the question. There, yeah. there we seem to have a difference, yeah. and, right? And yeah. whether, whether all fascist and authoritarian movements, I mean, to some extent, at least in modernity, they... they grow against the background of an existing democracy, but I mean, historically, we have cases of mass mobilizing movements, anti-democratic movements that did not grow out of mm. democracy. Jürgen should come in into this yeah. uh, to, argument. Yeah. I mean, I see the point uh, which Hedwig stresses very much, that there is a uh, close connection uh, of democratic, uh, democrat, of democracy, democratization, participation of the masses, inclusion on the one hand, and fascism, and certain populism. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I mean, look at what happened in the 1920s and early 30s in Germany and in Italy earlier. The role of the elites uh, must not be neglected. Mm. I mean, it is not only a movement to be ex <laughs> from democracy to populism to fascism, which you can explain in terms of mass behavior and uh, mobilization, which is part of it, however. But of course, this is what the Sonderweg vision of our history stressed very much, the importance of what the elites did, what the landowners and the landed aristocracy in the East did in this moment of juncture. 1932-1933. So you have to bring both sides together. The role of those who rule and those who are ruled and are <coughs> mobilized. That's one point. 
May I? Okay, go no, ahead. No, no. You ask. If you would well, like I mean, to add you, a sentence. You are the moderator. <laughs> so so I, I would recommend, because of the question of time and people are perhaps hungry for the buffet and also interested to ask questions to the panelists, I would like to ask a last question to us here at the panel, and that's the Holberg question. The question, can we answer or, or answer in a short uh, sentence or some a uh, short sentence, a short number of short sentences, uh, the question what we can learn from this, I, I would uh, think like Jürgen Kocker and all the others said, from the way the uh, Deutsche Sonderwegsdebatte um, was precised, reformulated, reframed uh, during the last uh, decade. So, so the question, it's still something in the broader public discussion, but there is a certain consensus on the question how to deal with German history. And the question is, is there something which helps us to analyze a contemporary fate of democracies in, in Europe. And uh, I don't know who, who would like to answer the first series of short <laughs> answers to a very long question. I apologize. Ladies first or in this way, <laughs> ladies last, as you like. Okay, okay I, I make it very short. Um, um, I think we can only understand um, Phenomenon like like Trump, if we understand that the history of of democracy is much more complicated and it's much more than dark and 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 bright, and yeah, I think this is this is um, an important lesson we should we should um, draw from the from from German history. Two points. <laughs> First, and no time to do it, but I want to say it. Uh, first, compare. The, what happened in the 20s and 30s, this is in the center of the Sonderweg thesis, mm -hmm. with a long time perspective behind. And if you see these curves, which, uh, uh, which Michael mentioned, that the number of democracies grew until recently, until the beginning of uh, this century, and then we now presently declining. This reminds you very much of what happened after 1918, 20s mm -hmm. and 30s, right? So, I mean, compare, ask for similarities and differences, and there are tremendous differences between that period and now. But there are some similarities, and I look at Etienne. I mean, the nation state continues to be central. In contrast to many expectations we have had, it is a, it's a structure which knows how to survive under very different positions, and the ambivalence which uh, Hedwig made clear, I fully agree, it can be a source of progress, but it can also be a source of, of, of wow, aggression, of catastrophe. And a second uh, similarity is, it, in all these cases, well, you can debate the relation to democracy, it's always at the uh, uh, conflict, a tension between this move towards the right, towards populism, towards fashion, on the one hand, and liberalism. The tradition of illiberalism, illiberalism, seems to me a, a long continuity. And so it's very important, uh, there's this project now on the liberal script, not only on a democratic script, to have this in mind. One last sentence. What you also perhaps can uh, learn or what you can find interesting in uh, the debate on this on the big for present day situation, what has been a liability can become an asset mm -hmm. over a long time. I mean, this Sonderweg, if we still use the word, is really an embodiment of major problems of German history. But you know, if you look back, uh, the consequences, the drawn out of that after 45, after 50. It was a process of learning. And maybe this, uh, the relative stability of uh, this country, of Germany, compared with others right now, uh, has something to do with the fact that we have this Sonderweg behind us and that we have tried to learn something out of that. 
And you can show this in the terms of the Constitution. Michael mentioned the proportional voting system. I would say the uh, re, uh, decision not to have too many plebiscitary elements in our Constitution is part of it. And secondly, elements of um, commemoration and uh, 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 culture and uh, the certain... <clears throat> move away from nationalism is also something which is related to this experience up to 1945. So which was a big liability and burden indirectly has become also a source of strength. It would be probably extremely interesting now to discuss, for example, the question, what about the uh, rules for the election of the members of a constitutional court compared in Poland and Germany, and the resilience of our process of electing uh, a certain type of uh, judges of the constitutional court. But we haven't enough time until midnight. Michael, uh, hasn't answered the question, <laughs> uh, and then some concluding remarks, please. <laughs> no, I can be very brief. I mean, let me just emphasize, Hedwig is, high, uh, is absolutely right in, in saying uh, authoritarianism in our days is different in that sense that it needs to have an electoral element. I mean, there is today something like electoral authoritarianism. There is no justification of rule anymore in modernity without reference to the people. And that makes those movements different. But they are nevertheless authoritarian. Um, there is no such thing as illiberal democracy. That is something that I, that I would argue. Um, the second point is, of course, uh, Jürgen is right as well. I mean, I still think that uh, the, I mean, from the perspective of a social scientist, Barrington Moore, a Barrington Moore perspective of the long durée, social origins of democracy and dictatorship can tell you still a lot. And in that sense, it's also very important to look on those long durée structures. I think there is one consensus in the whole room. Democracy is related to equal rights, as you have said to everyone. Uh, obviously, if I would now allow one single question before the buffet, these are definitely no equal rights for everyone. My proposal, therefore, is that no, no. <laughs> my proposal is that we use the question during the buffet to ask. This is more equal rights to everyone than concluding the discussion in the way that we have now uh, another long period of questions of the auditory. I would like to thank um, first uh, the uh, panelists here. Many thanks for the wonderful introductory statements, for the, I think, wonderful discussion we had. Um, especially many, many thanks to the Holberg Prize Committee, to the wonderful organizers behind and uh, surrounding the Prize Committee. That was a great pleasure that you have uh, offered us this wonderful gift of organizing. And I hope we haven't um, to wait for the 35th uh, or 40th anniversary of the Holberg Prize, but that could be a way we are, for example, presenting the prize winners in Berlin. If these are not Berliners or Germans, we are happy to uh, welcome uh, another series of common uh, events with the Holberg Prize. That's quite wonderful. And then especially thanks to all the people attending our discussion, those at the screen, we wish you a wonderful evening. If you are interested to share a buff at the Academy, please share us here physically. There are lots of interesting um, events at the Academy. And to all of you, many, many thanks. And now, bon appétit at the Buffet. Thank you. Thank you.